Thank you for coming, everyone, and welcome. Today, as you know, California enters its 70th day without a budget. As we stand here today, California is now only days away from having the latest budget in state history. We women lawmakers gathered together just a couple of weeks ago and started talking about the plight that California finds itself in. And today we're here to say enough is enough. We're here all. We're all here today with a message for our governor. Please, governor, respect the people of the state of California. Stop holding us hostage. Stop targeting women and children with the pain of cuts to balance our budget. And equally importantly, Governor, postpone your trip to China. Yeah. Stay here and work with the legislator, legislature on a fair and balanced budget agreement. Right now, nothing is more important to the people of this state. I want you to remember that old John Lennon song, Imagine. In the recent past, California imagined. Californians dreamed. And California acted on its dreams and made a brighter future come true. Well, we are here today to do more than imagine. We, the Democratic women of the California State Legislature, are here to insist. And typical of women, we do not insist on much, but we do insist on some fundamentals in our state budget. We insist upon decent education for our children. Yes. We insist upon higher education for our young adults. We need community colleges and universities so people can train for jobs and for the responsibilities of citizenship, an education that is sorely needed right now. We insist upon child care so small businesses can find workers and workers can hold down jobs. We insist upon health care for our mothers and our daughters. We reject the notion, the governor's notion, that we Californians can't come together and solve this problem for all of us. We reject his divide and conquer strategy. We reject his shock doctrine. We reject the governor's dead end vision of a decayed state. We reject his notion that wealthy and powerful corporations must enjoy enormous tax breaks while our children go uneducated and untended. That's just shameful. And as of today, we, the Democratic legislators of, Cal of the state of California, will no longer stand for such nonsense. No woman is a member of the Big Five negotiations this year, and we need the Big Five to know where we stand. Here's our bottom line. Last year's budget hit rock bottom. In order to earn our vote, and I'm going to say this for myself, but I think other people share this bottom line, and I'll let them say that themselves. In order to get my vote, and I believe a lot of other women in the legislature, this budget must improve California and get Californians back to work. In order to earn our support, this budget must fund K-12 through education and higher education at last year's level or better. It must fund child care and women's health care, such as Every Woman Counts, at last year's high levels or better. Yeah. And again, I think other women uh, share this bottom line. I'm going to let them speak for themselves. We have a lot of speakers. I'm going to start out with the, the lawmakers themselves. Uh, for each of them, uh, we're going to have a two-minute statement, and I'm going to start with Senator Lonnie Hancock from the 9th Senate District. Thank you, Noreen, and it's wonderful to see all of you out here in support of a budget that meets the needs of the next generation of the people of California. You know, for decades, we worked together as a state. We built great public institutions, universities, schools, roads, bridges, waterways. We invested in ourselves and we prospered. We were the envy of the nation and a magnet for people who came here. And what we have seen as women legislators is over the last few years, the dismantling of the things that made California a great state. We've seen them left broken, torn down, in disrepair, and we are here standing together to say enough is enough. Yeah. 
We are here to say we'd like to go back to the good old days when women and children first meant first in the lifeboats instead of first thrown overboard. <laughs> and most of all, we'd like to steer that ship away from the iceberg, <laughs> wouldn't we? <laughs> so I join with Noreen Evans, with the other women here, we are saying enough is enough. We are asking the governor to stay here in the Capitol and work with us on a budget that meets the needs of the next generation. And we will not accept a budget. I will not accept a budget that is balanced on the backs of women, children, and students one more time. As they say, not with my vote, not on my watch. Right. Thank you, Lonnie. Next, we'll have Senator Carol, Carol Liu. Oh, thank you, dear. It's great to see all of you out here this, this morning. And um, I, too, I want to add my voice to all of our voices, your voices, to say that enough is enough. Our education system, you all know this. We've gone from the best to the worst. Since 2008, $17 billion has been taken out of our K-12 higher ed system. Our fees have gone up. Kids can't get into classes, can't go to school. What does this mean for our future? It's time that we say enough is enough. And we just need to be together. We need to be together and we need to join each other. We need to rebuild this state with hope, new ideas, and skills to tackle this 21st century. We won't have that if we decimate our public education system. A cuts-only budget brings only despair. Let's build this state together where good health, a clean environment, and a first-class education is available to everybody. So let's stay together. Thank you very much for joining us today. Assemblymember Nancy Skinner. Thank you so much for joining us. You know, not only did the governor, uh, or, you know, is he leaving the country right now when we don't have a budget, he also took out some time this year to make a movie. Right? You heard about that movie, The Expendables. So, I decided to make my own movie. <laughs> my movie featured constituents in my district who called me because of the impact of the cuts on their lives. My movie was called Meet the Expendables. You can see it on my website. I welcome you. Let me tell you a little bit about some of the women, and it was mostly women, who called me who were seriously impacted if we were to adopt the budget as the governor wants us to. Christine Alvarez, she's a full-time worker. She has a full-time job at UC. She also has two preschool children. Her full-time job has a wage that can't afford market rate childcare. So she qualifies for the childcare that we provide through our public school system. That childcare is 100% on the chopping block with the governor's budget. Michelle, if her two children can't be in that child care, she would not afford to be able to go to work. So not only would we have two wonderful children out of a very important child care, we would have a woman who had to leave her job. Now, in addition to Michelle leaving her job, we have Sandy Farmer, who is the director of that child care program and has been the director for 28 years. She just gave pink, pink slips to all of her employees. So you have who are women. So all of those people would be out of a job. This is the impact of the governor's budget. This is not a California that we want to live in or that we would be proud of. So I join with my colleagues in the legislature, my women colleagues, and with you to say, no, governor, we reject those cuts. We will not have a budget that throws away a generation of Californians puts women out of work, and is unacceptable. Thank you.
Thank you, Nancy. Uh, before we go to our last uh, lawmaker, I want to acknowledge we have a couple of lawmakers that are here in solidarity but have decided not to speak. That's Senator Fran Pavley, Senator Ellen Corbett, and Assemblymember Mariko Yamada. So our last lawmaker will be Assemblymember Allison Huber, and then we'll hear from some folks who are actually experiencing these cuts. Ms. Huber. Thank you so much. And I'm here because I am a mother with a five-year-old and a seven-year-old, and I go to work every day. And I see what's happening to our child care system, to our domestic violence centers, and to our education system, and I will not stand for it. People, the governor knows this, but we need to remind him that budgets are about priorities and budget decisions have consequences. And we need your voices to help remind the governor about the consequences of his decisions. I remember back when our education system was in the top five in the country. I remember hearing the stories from my grandparents about what it was like to, to be in California and be the envy of the rest of the country that, oh, you're so lucky you go to school in California. When I was in kindergarten, I remember us having loads of paper that brown paper with all the lines on it and I remember the big tubs of paste that we used to fill up our little Dixie cups and have paste they don't even have glue in kindergarten and this governor's talking about cutting the fat out of education we don't have basic supplies in our classroom for our teachers to teach and I will not support a budget that has additional cuts to education Thank you. All right, I think the message is clear. Oh, excuse me, we did have one more uh, speaker, Assemblymember Mariko Yamada. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Noreen, for being so flexible. I actually just uh, came from a uh, funeral service and was not sure I was going to be able to join you. So thank you for your flexibility. You know, uh, I'm Assemblymember Mariko Yamada and am uh, privileged to chair the Committee on Aging and Long-Term Care in the Assembly. And normally I would be very pleased with something that was getting older, 70 days. But you know, I'm not happy about this at all. You know that all of us have joined here this morning uh, under these gray skies. This is a bit ominous for us. I think that we know that California is facing great crises and challenges ahead. And you know, women and older women are more likely to be in poverty and are more likely to uh, uh, be in receipt of in-home supportive services, uh, nursing home care, and also serve as caregivers. So this budget is not only assault on uh, women and children, uh, on education, but on older women and older adults that we serve so uh, so uh, strongly and deeply for here every day. So for those of us lucky enough to be of the gender that gives birth to new life, let us all join together, all the women here today and all of the sensitive men that have joined us, whether you're here because you have to work on this or because you're here, you understand you're at least 50% of the problem and the solution. So please join us, join us as we give birth to a new California. Thank you very much. Nice job. And thanks for acknowledging the support of men. I noticed that uh, maybe all of the press corps is male today, but we appreciate that. Um, all right, our next, okay, we have a female there. Good, good for you. Um, <laughs> Hey, I, I do want to say though, I mean, you can't, you can't have a women's movement and you can't have this kind of a movement without men. It's just reality. So we, we do want to acknowledge the supportive role that you're all playing. Um, all right, next week, moving on, we'll have Patty Siegel, uh, the Executive Director of Parent Voices, and uh, she will address child care cuts. Thank you. Hi. I want to just thank everyone for coming out today. I'm actually here for the Campaign to Save Child Care, which represents over 35 organizations, parents and providers and advocates throughout the state. And I see Visalia, I see San Joaquin, I mean ICLA, people have traveled far and wide because this budget is the most devastating budget that we have ever seen for parents and children in California. I've been an advocate, I've spent time here for more than 35 years. We have never seen this kind of wholesale assault on women and children. And we know something 
that evidently the governor doesn't know. And that is that child care keeps California working. You know it. Child care keeps California working. Child care keeps California working. How many people does it keep working? Working. OK. In this budget alone, which would dismantle almost our entire child care system, 130 child care workers' jobs are on the line, and many of those folks are here in the audience. 38,000 of those jobs are full-time jobs. 200,000 children with 100,000 working parents. This is what's on the line in this budget. And it fans out from there, because every child care center that's here today buys supplies. They contribute taxable, ta they pay their taxes, they buy the goods and services that keep California working. We are not the problem, we are the solution, and we cannot, we cannot understand why we, why women and children and good providers in homes and centers across the state are a target in this budget. We are here in solidarity with the Democratic women lawmakers, and we are proud that you are taking this stand, and we will be here with you day after day until we have a fair budget, not just any budget, because people in this audience are on the line right now. There are child care centers and programs that are closing this week, next week. They're on the brink. And when you close a child care center, when you lose a trained teacher, they don't just snap back. They find another job, and then we have to struggle to find the people, because we don't just want anyone to care for our children. We want the best best trained, most caring, most knowledgeable people in the whole state. And that means that we need a budget ASAP. Tomorrow, the next day, we can't wait six days for the governor to come back from China. How many child care centers will we lose? Now, the people who understand this front and center are parents and providers. And it's my honor now to introduce Janine Quinones from the Parent Voices chapter in Marin County. She's the parent of a four-year-old and a seven-year-old. She is the living proof of how the child care system works. And she'll tell you why this budget is so unfair and why we have to get a good budget right away. Hello. As you know, I'm Janine. And I'm here today to tell my story, and it's not only my story, so um, please listen. I'm a single parent living in Marin County on a one-bedroom apartment. I have two kids, Hannah and Hayden. They're seven and four, and um, I do not receive any child support, um, so I'm the only person in the home. Uh, who makes an income. So without Marin Child Care's financial help for child care and daycare uh, expenses, I um, wouldn't really be able to make a living. Um, those expenses are around $2,000 a month. I only earn $2,800 a month. My rent is $1,025 a month. So um, I'm not really making it, you know? Um, I used to be on CalWORKs Cash Aid for a few years when my daughter was born. And this program really, really helped me to get the job that I've been at for the past five years. I work full time as a case manager with Buckaloo Programs, uh, their Marin Assisted Independent Living Program. I help adults with schizophrenia, and they're at risk as well for their services in the mental health community. Um, so, and also very important I hear is having an education. I do have my master's degree in counseling psychology from the University of San Francisco and I am working toward my marriage family therapist licensure. I do have my adult hours. I still need to get my 500 child hours before taking the exam. So my goal, I'm still in process. I still need child care and daycare. Uh, so my strong stance I take uh, on this issue concerns myself and all, I mean all of the many single working women 
that I know that are in my exact position. If my stage three subsidy was to be um, lost per the governor, I would lose everything that I've worked my entire life for. I would lose my job. I would become unemployed. I would lose my apartment. I would become homeless with my kids. I mean, is this what we want to happen? I'm a real person and I represent so many other women, single parents. Also, this would affect uh, the child care providers. As of September 1st, as you know, my son's family child care provider and my daughter's after school child care providers will not get paid until this budget is passed. That's why it's so important it gets passed right now, no later. Um, so being in limbo is so stressful, it's so fear provoking and anxiety provoking that I can't, you know, it's hard to take any more of this. Where are my children gonna go? If they can't go anywhere, I can't work. And isn't that what our society is about, making a living? So this is why I'm fighting against Arnold Schwarzenegger's proposed budget cuts. Thank you. Okay, so Janine talked about her family child care provider. Our next speaker is Janlina Austin, a family child care provider here in Sacramento. And 54% of the nearly 40,000 licensed family child care providers in California are caring for children, at least one or two children, who receive state subsidies. So this is a lot of small businesses that are affected and Jean Lena is going to tell you how it affects her and others like her. Hello, my name is Jelena Austin. I'm a family child care provider. Thank you. Thank you everyone for being here. I've been in this field for 15 years, eight years as a child care provider. I provide care to families with special services who have special needs. There are no shortcuts. The rewards are wonderful. I want to share a story about a little boy who was diagnosed failure to thrive. I was able to provide care, nutrition, learning experience, and lots of love. He is now in school, excelling above academic expectations. My work is hard, but I love it. I'm great at it. I work 12 to 16 hour days, all week, all year long. I also struggle to put food on the table and to pay bills, especially when I don't get paid for months because of the state budget issues. The working families I serve, whether they get subsidies or not, always struggled. I've never seen them fearful or afraid. I do now. I'm afraid also for them and their children and for me and my family as well. I see our legislators refusing to budge or compromise because of the pact they've made amongst themselves. It is more important to them than the lives of children and families. This is appalling. It is these kinds of politics that to a large extent is responsible for California's failure to thrive. I call on our legislators and our governor while he's making movies. People are losing their homes. People's, people are committing suicide because they don't know what's going to happen with their money. This is a real life agenda. This is not a Hollywood movie. I call on our legislators, our governor, to stop these political games. This is not a party pack. This is human lives being affected. Summon up your courage and do the right thing for California. I urge you all to keep child care intact. It affects everyone. We keep California working. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next we have Kathy Kinnear, the CEO of Planned Parenthood. Kathy? Hello. We are all here today because someone we know is impacted by the state's economy. And the governor's budget would make difficult circumstances for women and their families. And further, we know that many of the women who are served, whether it's in a state health care program, child care, education, jobs, that they don't have any other place to, to turn. We are the safety net for California women and families. Someone you know needs help, our help. Someone you know worries about where they're going to sleep tonight. What we need to do and communicate to the governor is the importance of doing a budget that isn't balanced on the back of women and their families. We need a budget that respects 
the honor and dignity that people try to earn every day with a little bit of help from us. Many of these programs bring in federal dollars, and the governor, by making these cuts, is throwing away federal money, money that doesn't come into our economy. At Planned Parenthood, we have 100 health centers around the state. We serve a million women. We've seen a 10% increase as a result of women losing jobs and losing their health insurance. That's an enormous increase. At a time, the governor's proposing to roll back rates he pays to the providers. That will allow, not allow us to expand, to meet the growing needs. Let me just share one story, and we have hundreds of stories, from a woman who came to Planned Parenthood. I have used you for years, but I've never had health insurance. If I couldn't come here for my yearly checkup, I would not have been diagnosed with precancerous uh, cells and able to get the treatment that prevents my cancer, my cervical problems from becoming a cancer. Preventing breast and cervical cancer are life-saving for the women and families that depend on this program and other programs. We need to protect California's women's health. We need to bring in all the federal dollars so we can use those across the board to keep our doors open to serve the women and their families. So someone you know is impacted and someone you know is asking for your help. And we want to thank all of the women legislators who are here today to say, I hear you and we're there for you. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. With more on how the budget cuts affect women throughout the state, here's Donna Sanderson with the Susan G. Komen Foundation. Thank you to the legislators that are out here today and to the sensitive men that are with us. Uh, we appreciate all of your support. I am here today representing the seven California affiliates of Susan G. Komen for the Cure and to speak on behalf of the uninsured women in our state who have been denied services that were promised to them by our state government. Susan G. Komen for the Cure was founded on a promise from one sister, Nancy Brinker, to another, Susan G. Komen, as she lay dying of breast cancer. A promise is a promise. The test of strength of that promise is not when money is flowing and times are good, but when times get tough. You don't meet, need me to tell you that times are now tough. Now is the time when we find out if the governor meant his promise to the women and families of California, the promise that health care is a priority. We understand that during these difficult times, there have to be cuts in services. We cannot go on spending money that we don't have. However, the cuts should be judicious with some thought about the future impact and if we are saving money today to create much higher cost in the future. The Department of Health's Every Woman Counts program provides screening for women who are not poor enough to qualify for Medi-Cal but can af not afford health insurance or large co-pays or deductibles. As of January 1, the program cut services to women 40 to 49 and placed a freeze on women age 50 and older. These were presented as cost containment moves, even though money were still being spent on education and outreach services for an outreach for services that no longer existed. The program was in disarray. But thankfully, Assembly Members Noreen Evans and Pedro Nava cared enough to bring the agency to task and are attempting to make changes so that the program provides the life-saving services it was created to provide. The seven California affiliates of Susan G. Komen for the Cure are co-sponsoring with Assembly Members Evans and Nava, AB 1640, a bill that unanimously received bipartisan support. The bill addresses accountability and transparency within the EWC program so that the state government can be good stewards of the public's money and make sure the funds go where they will have the greatest impact. With the EWC program, a small amount of money appropriated now for screening as suggested by the Budget Conference Committee compromise would save the state a thousand-fold or more in the future. 
The compromise would reinstate services for women 40 to 49 and lift the freeze on new enrollments. I'll cut to the chase. <laughs> Thank you, Noreen. <laughs> Not, I love you, I love you. Okay, today is day 70 on the governor's counter of days without a budget. Well, we want him to know that we, the women of California, have a counter as well. Today marks the day that an estimated 300 women's lives might have been saved by every woman counts. These women are no longer with us. There are over 300 more families without a sister, a wife, or a mother. We ask the governor, how many lives will it take? Thank you. Enough is enough, Governor. You heard about the Governor closing down the Every Woman Counts program, and now we're going to hear from Carol Pello, whose life was literally saved by this program. Hello, everyone. When I was first asked to speak, I'm thinking, who am I? I'm nobody important. But I realize I am important, because I'm living proof of how important the Every Woman Counts program is. In 2007, I was diagnosed with stage three breast cancer. And the way I was diagnosed was I had gone to Planned Parenthood because I had no insurance, although I'd been working full time since I was 17. And um, they diagnosed me and they put me on an Every Woman Counts program and took over all my worries. I didn't have to worry about doctors or what care I was gonna get or could I afford the chemo and the radiation and eventually the mastectomy. They took care of everything and took all the worries off me and if it wasn't for that program I would not be here today. So, uh, I'm a little nervous, sorry. Um, my, my, what I'd like to say to the governor and the legislators is that every woman does count either we count as a survivor or we count as a statistic and it's up to them to make that choice. Thank you. And we're glad you're here, Carol. Next, we uh, are going to address the situation of domestic violence shelters. As you may know, the governor um, vetoed uh, uh, funding this past year in, in the current year's budget for domestic violence shelters throughout the state. So I'm going to call on Nico Johnson, who is the executive director of a shelter in Grass Valley that unfortunately just closed. Good morning and thank you to each of you for coming out today to show your support. The Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault Coalition serves the rural communities of Grass Valley, Nevada City and surrounding areas. With comprehensive services, we have been standing against domestic and sexual violence for over three decades. It was not until the year 2000 that DVSAC opened its first emergency shelter, able to offer a free, confidential, safe shelter for women and children fleeing abusive relationships. With the recent loss of funding and the current unsigned budget, the DVSAC has closed the doors to that shelter. That is the same shelter that provided over 4,000 bed nights per year, those bed nights being free from the terror survivors experience experience at the hands of their abusers every day. We were forced to choose between keeping the shelter or our walk-in client service center open, and in order to maintain the integrity of our services, we made the very difficult decision to close that facility. Similar decisions were made across the state as domestic violence centers have laid off staff, has, have reduced the life-saving supportive services that help battered women and their children. Today, without a physical shelter, we continue to stand against domestic violence, providing counseling, legal advocacy, and other supportive services. However, without a shelter, we can only safe house survivors and community members' homes, just as we did when we opened our doors in 1978. And yet, those in the gravest danger and at the highest risk of injury and death are the women and children we cannot serve. Placing them in someone's home puts them more at risk and those around them at risk, and we no longer have that confidential, safe, professionally staffed shelter to help them. And not only are lives at risk because of the loss of shelter funding, but the movement to end domestic violence has suffered a major setback. As the message being sent to survivors is we can't find a way to provide safety and services that we know make a difference. Survivors of domestic violence, you just don't matter enough. 
Through reinstating the domestic violence shelter funds, we send the message to survivors that you matter, and we will stand with you to end domestic violence in California. Thank you. Thank you very much. Enough is enough, Governor. Our last speaker is Tracy Stafford. She's former Mrs. California, and she can personally attest to the importance of domestic violence shelter funding. Tracy. Thank you. You know, you'd think after so many years of telling my story, it would get easier, but it really, it really doesn't. And every time I come up here to speak about domestic violence, it's always something being cut. And for domestic violence specifically, it's about power and control. And my abuser would punch me in the face publicly, crowds of people larger than this, and nobody would look, nobody would see me, or they pretended not to see me, because they had to see me. He would slam me against walls, against cars, just to further solidify that I was nothing, that I did not matter. And what happened was the community around me confirmed that. And that's what I feel is happening here today. The governor is saying he does not see me. He doesn't see the survivors, the children. And it, it just, I can't even tell you, it just breaks my heart. We're going backwards. How is this possible? What else can I say other than it's important for everyone to stand up and to say, you see me. For those who can't speak for themselves, for others who won't stand up and speak, I'm here to do it for them. And I'm here to say, please see me. Please make a difference. Pick up the phones. Because we are here and we do matter. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Enough is enough, Governor. Enough is enough. Enough is enough. Enough is enough. <laughs> enough. I just want to say one thing in closing. As our governor prepares to leave tomorrow for another continent, we want him to know we are not leaving. We are staying put. We're women. We give birth to, raise, and believe in the next generation, and we will not fail them. We stand for a budget that foresees a brighter day for our state and helps lay the groundwork for that brighter day. Please, Governor, we believe in a better tomorrow. Please work with us. Please work with all of the women and the men that showed up here today in support and in solidarity. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you to all of our speakers. And a better day is coming. Let's just stand together and work together. Thank you.